Starting off with the Atari 2600, the first emulator I tried was called Stella PSP. This is actually a port of a well-known PC emulator of the Atari 2600. It's based on what's now an older version, of course, so there are a few incompatibilities. Nothing major, but I did make note of an emulator crash when playing Hero, which had crashed the PSP itself after trying to exit back to the XMB. If you're new to this sort of thing, don't worry, a crash is not serious. It's just when a console encounters a fatal error that'll have you hard reset the system. You've more than likely had to do this before on other game systems. I tried out Air Raid, the infamous 30 grand holy grail of Atari games, and this turned out to be a garbled mess. I tried a couple other games with mixed results. No matter what I did, my Circus Atari friend wouldn't move, despite the paddle functionality is said to be there. As such, my poor Circus Assistant went... Ouch. Mega Mania and Solaris suffered from some texture blurring on movement, which was a bit unpleasant. This doesn't make the game unplayable by any stretch, but it's not preferred to say the least. I figured at this point things didn't look so hot, so I tried another well-known Atari 2600 emulator for the PSP, known only as PSP 2600. Immediately I noticed Solaris and Mega Mania looked much better, but Circus Atari still didn't work. I tried some other paddle games like Egomania and Kaboom, and to my surprise those worked fine. So I'm not sure what the issue was with Circus Atari? Maybe the ROM wasn't ripped properly? I took a shot at Air Raid, and while the problem from before was less common, it still existed, making it practically unplayable. What is it about this game that's so hard to emulate? I tried Donkey Kong, and oddly enough, the moment I moved it would reset the game. Otherwise, Miss Pac-Man managed to run a little bit slower than on original hardware. Everything else appeared to have worked just fine, even homebrew titles like Skeleton Plus and the prototype for Sinistar. Atari 2600 emulation on the PSP is not bad, but I do feel there's room for improvement. Even on PSP 2600, I'd give its performance a 7 out of 10. A couple sites where you can find the emulator for the Magnavox Odyssey 2 will tell you it's an emulator for the very first Odyssey console. That simply isn't the case. It even comes with an Odyssey 2 game pre-installed being Acrobat, a Circus Atari clone. Curious, I've since gone back to the emulator to see if it would run any of the original Magnavox Odyssey games, and nothing came up. So it is just that, a Magnavox Odyssey 2 emulator. The emulator itself is called Odyssey Emulator 1.0, although the game's loader says Simple Flames. I should probably mention that the way this emulator loads ROMs is from the root of the device in a subfolder called ROMs slash ROMs ODD. Acrobat ran fine, as it should. Then I tried Frogger, and something was really off with the collision of this game. I'm not familiar with this version of it, but cars couldn't seem to down me. Only the water did, and I wasn't even able to cross the river at all. I tried Popeye, and I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. Bizarre. So I kept going and tried Super Cobra. This worked just fine. I tried Demon Attack, again unable to move. I was really curious what could be causing this issue. Then I opened the in-game keyboard and started pressing random keys to see if maybe these games used a different control method. Well, they don't, but something I did there each time managed to enable the controls. I was very confused by this, but after that bizarre fix, I played a damned good round of Demon Attack. I love this game. I went back and tried to play Popeye with this fix, but no dice. I tried Atlantis. I guess in this version you have no turret in the middle? But yeah, this one played fine. Magnavox Odyssey 2 emulation is a bit iffy on the Odyssey emulator 1.0, but usually playable. I'd give the performance a 5 out of 10. Next we've got the Atari 800 or Atari 8-bit computer system. The emulator I used plays both Atari 800 and 5200 games. Regardless, we'll be looking at this emulator again in a little bit for the 5200 emulation. This emulator is called Atari 800 PSP 2.1.0.1. First I tried that obscure version of Laser Gates. It worked great. I know, there are some weird laser patterns on the top and bottom. From real hardware footage online, I can see this to be a real part of the game. I... I don't know why. Everything else I tried worked just fine, so Atari 800 PSP 2.1.0.1, in terms of performance on the Atari 800 side, gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Now on to the Intellivision. The emulator we'll use here is called PSPINT. After setting up your preferred control scheme, since the Intellivision controller is... interesting, the emulation is superb. Well, it was until I loaded Pac-Man, which crashed the emulator to the XMB. Besides Pac-Man, everything else I tried was golden. I don't know what it is about Pac-Man that would cause it to crash, because otherwise this is all around a great emulator. I give PSP INT's compatibility rating an 8 out of 10. I'd love to give it a 9, but the whole software crash makes it kinda hard to praise past an 8. I recently gave in to the call of the ColecoVision, and now I gotta say, I'm a pretty big fan. The arcade quality games look outstanding for their time. The only problem is that controller. But unlike the Intellivision, you can swap them out for another controller, such as the Atari 2600 joystick or Sega Genesis gamepad. 
So how does this all work on the PSP? Well, the emulator we'll be taking a look at is called Colum PSP 2.6.1. I booted the emulator and was greeted with the following message upon attempting to load a ROM. No loadable files found in the archive. Huh? Now you might be thinking, you gotta unzip them. Usually I do. But for a lot of PSP emulators, I've come to find they require you put them in zipped folders. Don't know why. If you come across any problems emulating games on the PSP, try zipping the ROMs. You might find success that way. Or not, it's always worth a try. As it turns out, this emulator only reads ColecoVision ROMs in the .rom file format. Doesn't matter whether you've zipped them or not. Initially I was using ROMs under the .col format, that I suppose is unsupported by the emulator. From this point on I had no issues running any ColecoVision games I threw at it. If you're new to the system, do realize that you'll need to press the number 1 on the virtual keyboard to execute the game in one player mode. It's like flicking the reset knob on the Atari 2600. ColecoVision games run great using colon PSP 2.6.1. With the small nuisance of being selective in the file format you pick, it lands a highly respectable but not flawless 9 out of 10. So we're back at it with Atari 800 PSP 2.1.0.1. I gave it a 10 out of 10 in terms of Atari 800, or 8-bit emulation. How does it perform with 5200 games? For the most part, all the games I tested worked just fine. Exception for two of them. Joust had audio, but no visual. Vanguard displayed the Atari 5200 intro screen, but wouldn't let me pass that. Otherwise, yeah, the emulator works just fine. For 5200 emulation, I give Atari 800 PSP 2.1.0.1 a performance rating of 7 out of 10. Man, would I like to own a Vectrex. For those of you that don't, though, here's a decent emulator for it called VecX, ported by ZX-91. I'm fairly certain there's no harm in downloading these. All but certain the system's games are abandonware by now. My only issue with it was playing Berserk. Ironic I chose this one first. Quite a bad introduction it was, as the sound is glitched. Every sound that plays holds at the last bite, meaning you'll constantly hear... this. If you turn the sound off though, then you got nothing to worry about. Far as I could tell, everything else worked flawlessly. I didn't test every game for the system, but I can only assume there are some other issues amongst the library. I'll play it safe and give this performance an 8 out of 10. Next up, Fuse PSP 0.10.0.21. That's a mouthful. This is a Sinclair ZX Spectrum emulator. I booted it up and... Oh, that's disappointing, just a bunch of error messages. I then came across the game known as Bongo and realized what the issue was. This emulator seems to only accept ROMs in the .z80 file format, so I had to go and download a whole bunch more, ensuring they were in the correct format. Initially, the library seemed to work perfectly, but then I tried R-Type. Yeah, this isn't normal. I also tried Rampage and... the controls don't work. Not even the virtual keyboard does anything here. I tried the Star Wars arcade game and there was no sound. The game itself is without sound effects, but there's supposed to be a midified version of the credits theme running during play, which you won't find here for whatever reason. Afterburner also had no sound. Well, you'll wish it didn't. The original game should have sound effects, but instead you'll hear a rather frequent buzz sound that really hurts to hear. If playing this one, you'll need to mute it. I had no issues with some games, but I'd say it's a 50-50 whether or not your selected game will run well. Fuse PSP 0.10.0.21 is promising, but needs some polish. Performance-wise, I'd go with a 5, maybe leaning towards 6 out of 10. The Commodore 64 emulator for PSP is called Vice PSP C64 2.2.15. How is it? Well, upon first using it, I noticed something a bit familiar. This is another emulator that requires you to use ROMs in a specific file format. Such file format this time is T64. Right off the bat, a number of games didn't have sound. Even worse off, some games wouldn't respond to controls. Both Gorf and Puckman suffered from this, which rendered them completely unplayable. Well, I could shoot in Gorf, but that's it. After playing Galaxian, I noticed that every game I played had gone silent. So I started to wonder, did the emulator just bug out? I tried Galaxian again and there was no sound, so yep, something happened to crash the sound emulation. After restarting, I tried Gianna Sisters and the sound was perfect. So that's one thing already that would be a big annoyance. In summary, some games don't respond to controls and swapping games may cause the audio to break. Not looking good for Vice PSP. Still, when the games did work, they worked. Galaxian might have played a bit slow, but it was tolerable. According to this forum post, it seems a number of people have had issues with the emulator not performing very well. As a whole, Vice PSP C64 2.2.15 was rocky. It's still a noble accomplishment, and in some cases it works quite well. That's why I wish I could give it a higher rating, but as it stands, there are issues at every turn. So this emulator's performance gets a 5 out of 10 from me. The Sega SG-1000 is a system that is said to not have a working emulator for the PSP. See? While there is no dedicated SG-1000 emulator, there does exist one which will still play them. Introducing SMS Plus PSP 1.5. As I first tested some games, I noticed this huge Game Gear overlay. Well, I mean, you'd have to be looking elsewhere from the screen not to notice it. 
I went to turn that off and then I loaded another game and there it is again. Unfortunately, no matter what you do, first time games will always have this overlay displayed over top. Doesn't it seem weird to have a Game Gear system playing games inside a PSP? I don't know, I don't understand why someone would want this. However, the SG-1000 emulation is great, except for in Twinbee. Well, maybe it was just the ROM I was using, but this is all that happened. Jumbo. Other than that, no issues with this emulator. SMS Plus PSP 1.5 for SG-1000 emulation performance gets a 10 out of 10. So long as that Twinbee thing was a ROM issue, I genuinely have no idea. Nestor J. If you've had a hacked PSP before, you likely know this name, because this is one of the most popular emulators on the PSP. It's probably due to the simplicity, easy to understand menus, and great performance. It'll run just about anything you throw at it, so long as it's not one of those with a large file size. For example, 2-in-1 Street Dance plus Hit Mouse won't boot, since it's over 2 megabytes in size. Otherwise, I've had no issues with Nestor J. The version I use is Nestor J for PSP plus 0.61RM. Its performance is a 10 out of 10 for me. Yeah, it won't run those massive file games, but it's not like the Nintendo was ever meant to do that anyways. Ah, the MSX. The Japanese computer system that I'll likely never own and likely never give the glory of playing the Great Bosconian port on its genuine hardware. The MSX is home to a lot of great arcade conversions, and some originals you've no doubt heard of, like Metal Gear. The emulator I use is called MSX for PSP v3.5.41. Of course, the first game I try is Bosconian, and if you know this port, you should notice the absence of the voice synthesizer that says Blast Off when you start a new game. So yes, that doesn't emulate properly, and Rally X has some noticeable screen tearing, I will admit, but that's really all there is to notice out of the norm. To my experience with the emulator, everything else should be solid. Metal. Gear. Solid. Man, is this ever a faithful port of King and Balloon. Pardon me whilst I play Superboy. If you're expecting this emulator to run poorly, sorry, nothing. MSX for PSP v3.5.41's performance gets a 9 out of 10 from me. The Amiga emulator for the PSP wants something special from you. It'll ask you for something called kick13.rom, which I later found out was the system BIOS. Fill her up and you got yourself an Amiga emulator. PSP UAE 0.72. You'll probably notice that this emulator looks pretty different from the rest. That's because it is. Here you'll have to mount a game under a specific drive known as DF0. If you've placed your ROMs in the disk folder, clicking DF0 will open that directory where you can load one of them. Do a soft reset and you're off. Afterburner played pretty slowly, and to boot it had no sound. On to the next game, I tried Clue Clue Land, also played pretty slow. Had sound, but it was very choppy. It, is that a Doom theme I hear? Pipe Dream played great. Besides somewhat crackly audio, but it's very minor. Okay, Galaga 92. Strange, I don't remember there being a 92 Galaga. I tried Mortal Kombat 2. Keyword tried. Lastly, I tried Maniac Mansion. Finally, a game that runs smooth. No disc present in Unit 1. I'm pressing. It's not doing nothing. Yeah, PSP UAE 0.72 is a piece of work. The emulator shows promise and potential, but it's not something I'd actively recommend. It's got a 4 out of 10 for me in performance, which isn't to discredit its developers. This might in fact be very impressive. I don't know much about the Amiga, but as a gameplay experience, this is very wishy-washy in presentation. Caprice 32 PSP 4.2.0.2 I found out that writing cat will show you the files of the selected disk ROM, where you're then to write, corresponding to the game, run, a quotation mark, insert name of game, insert file extension, enter. Firstly, you'll need to know how to open the virtual keyboard, which is done by holding the R trigger. Then you select keys with the square button. To use the shift key, select it, and then press the circle button to put a temporal lock on the key. Go back to shift once finished and press the circle button again to unlock the shift key. Once I was into the games, things started off great, but by the time I got to Bubble Bobble, there were some noticeable issues. One being how you can't control Bub no matter what you do. Rainbow Islands! Aside from some pretty crackly audio, the game seemed to work fine. Really, the way I see it, Caprice 32 PSP 4.2.0.2 is passable, however being unable to control some is a big letdown. I'm sure the number of games which do this is low, but it's still an issue. I'd have to give this emulator's performance a 6, leaning closer to a 7 out of 10. As an expert, I like the 7800 because there are great arcade hits like Mario Brothers. <laughs> The Atari 7800 emulator is known as PSP 7800 v1.2.0 Firmware 5X. I can tolerate fart noises and spurts, but the 7800 takes it to the whole new level. The emulator? Well, it adds a little bit of extra crust with some bonus crackles. No, it's really not too bad, not too noticeable once you've gotten used to it, but wow, is it possible for sound to be ugly? 9 out of 10 for performance. A bit of an audio improvement would have made this perfect. 
Not the 7800, though. It needed a lot more than just an audio improvement. I've actually got two Sega Master System emulators up and running. Firstly, what I used for the SG-1000 emulation, SMS plus PSP 1.5, and Master Boy V 2.02 by Bruni. Just take a look at Fantastic Dizzy on SMS Plus and compare it with Master Boy. SMS Plus had a number of other issues with Master System games and of course that wonderful Game Gear overlay. At least SMS Plus emulates the Sega intro properly in those Sonic games. That's something Master Boy can't do. But yeah, I found performance-wise, everything was superior in this version of Master Boy. Master Boy is actually a combination emulator. It plays Master System, Game Gear, Game Boy, and Game Boy Color. We'll take a look at it for those other three consoles in their respective generation. So, in Master Boy, you've got a great user interface and superb emulation of classics like Astro Warrior, New Zealand Story, my god, my ears, R-Type, oh, okay, it crashed, and Sonic Blast. Uh, is that supposed to happen on real hardware? That might not be very easy to replicate. Master Boy has issues with Master System games, but it does look better and seems to have the best frame rate and audio emulation comparatively, except for the Sega intro for some reason. Coolspot has this black line across the screen, which is supposed to be there, but not so that you can see several lines of pixels underneath it between the HUD and the gameplay. Not sure what caused that, but I'd wager it's something related to resolution. SMS plus PSP 1.5's Master System emulation I consider to be... alright. I'd give its performance a 7 out of 10. Master Boy V 2.02 by Bruni is your other option, which is superior in a number of areas, but is less stable. Bugs and all, I'd tally it to a 7 out of 10, maybe leaning more towards an 8. Whichever one you decide to use would be based on what elements of emulation you would prioritize for it. First we have the TurboGrafx-16, or PC Engine, emulator being PSP Hugo 1.3.1 Firmware 5X. Ah, Bonk's Adventure. What's happened to this series anyways? I know they had a GameCube side-scroller at one point, but I haven't heard from them since. Anyways, Bonk's Adventure works just fine. Airzonk doesn't though, the sound just doesn't exist, and the graphics are super flickery. I would say it ranges on borderline unplayable, which is such a shame for one of their more easily recognized titles. Another game I had issues with was Thunderblade, though these were strictly in slowdowns. Not that you'd like to play Thunderblade on anything other than the original arcade though. This game really took a punch when it came to home consoles. But besides that, the remainder of the games I tried worked just fine. Maybe a bit of a slowdown here or there, but it's all minor. If you're a TurboGrafx-16 enthusiast, you'll know the system had a CD unit. This is also emulatable on the PSP, but after multiple attempts at trying to figure this out, there was just no way I could get this to work. Chances are I was doing something wrong, but for the life of me, I just kept getting this load error. PSP Hugo is a pretty good emulator. Not perfect, but some tweaks could have registered as such. I'll give this one's performance an 8 out of 10. I actually own one Sharp X68000 game, yet another Japanese computer system I have one game for. On MSX, I have Bosconian. For the Sharp X68000, I have Bosconian. It's rare that a home port rivals the arcade counterpart. Only other example I can immediately think of is Contra. How do these games run on the Sharp X68000 PSP emulator, known as PX68K for PSP version 0.10? Oh, uh, I guess they won't run at all if the emulator doesn't work. So as it turns out, this emulator requires a BIOS file. But it doesn't tell you that and just boots you back to the XMB if you try to launch it without one. You'll have to put it in a subfolder named .coropi, which isn't explained. I had to look that one up to find out. Those files, by the way, are called cgrom.dat and iplrom.dat. Anyways, once you do have that BIOS installed, you'll see some Japanese. All you have to do is open the FDD1 and select a disk, being the ROM you've downloaded. Head to System, then Reset, wait a moment and your game should be good to go. On boot, things sound promising, but that changes once you get the graphics on screen. At least that was the case for Bosconian. But even still, this isn't really bad at all. It's totally playable, but indeed, it does play a bit slow. Also, the voice guy has a strange obsession with spouting off randomly. Oh. Then I tried Rally X. Oh my god, that is such a wholesome MIDI. So yes, it does run slow and the frame rate is choppy, but it's still quite playable. Fantasy Zone was less so. The choppy frame rate made this fast-paced game rather difficult to play, and honestly, I wouldn't recommend playing this on the emulator. I tried Salamander, and while it took longer than the rest to load, I did manage to get it running in-game. It's not unplayable, I suppose, but for a game of this nature, playing in moderate slow motion isn't preferred, no doubt. Also, for some reason, the voice synthesizer wouldn't shut up at times. There exists a port of the original arcade game specifically made for the PSP, so this isn't necessary to run here regardless. 
PX68K for PSP version 0.10 is surprisingly decent for a relatively obscure computer system outside its country of origin. That might be because the emulator itself is mostly in Japanese. However, it's still very easy to navigate in English, as English text can be found throughout its programming. But you might get lost in translation for a few things like the boot sequences that are strictly coded in Japanese. Its performance is off and on, so it's got a ways to come until perfected. But even as it stands in this version 0.10, very impressive. Still, we're looking at performance here, so I gotta go with my gut and give it a 6 out of 10. Sega Genesis emulation has been around and of great quality even in the earlier days of emulation on the PSP hardware. Today, it's really no short of excellent. Oddly enough, when upgrading to Pico Drive version 1.92.3, I noticed a few games were actually running a bit worse than before on Pico Drive version 1.51. Later versions of Pico Drive implemented Sega CD and 32X compatibility. 1.51 can play Sega CD games, in fact, it plays them superbly. Genesis games particularly were great, with Sonic 3 and Knuckles keeping a solid 60 frames per second throughout without a single moment of lag outside the original hardware limitations. To my own experience, the latest 1.92.3 plays a number of games far worse, with rare but existing sound slowdowns and occasional screen tearing. The frame rate is unstable as well. Sonic 3 and Knuckles had issues with this one, yet played like a dream on version 1.51. There could be varying reasons for this, I'm not too sure myself, but when it comes to Genesis and Sega CD games, I use 1.51 and I think it's gonna stay that way. In fact, I don't see much of a reason to upgrade at all. 32X games barely run. It's really just a proof of concept, if anything. I didn't even manage to get it to show any graphics on the base emulator, but somehow whatever core was in the all-in-one emulator retroarch was able to demonstrate the 32X capabilities. None of the 32X games are fully playable, and I really doubt you'll boot them up a second time after trying it out. Sonic CD runs with only the occasional minor slowdowns on version 1.51. It struggles near consistently on version 1.92.3. But using PlayStation for Sonic emulation is overrated. Portable Genesis gaming is always at its height on the Sega Nomad. Really? No, not really! So, I'm giving my preferred choice, the 1.51 release, playing Genesis and Sega CD games, a performance rating of 10 out of 10. 32x support playability on the newer 1.92.3, I give a performance rating of 2 out of 10. Performance-wise, this is no more than a concept. Capcom as a whole I'm not really familiar with. It was interesting to find out that they have a whole branch of arcade units that I suppose use similar hardware. The emulator for the CPS-1 is called CPS-1 PSP 2.3.1 for Firmware 3, and the emulator for the CPS-2 is called CPS-2 PSP 2.3.1 for Firmware 3. I'd like to make note of one thing. Emulators that are followed by a firmware version do not necessarily mean they will only work on that firmware. Yes, there are some incompatibilities between firmwares, but all the ones I'll be listing today work just fine on a modified 6.60. First impressions with CPS-1 were incredible. I had no issues whatsoever with this emulator. Now this is what I call phenomenal. I give its performance a 10 out of 10. The CPS-1 plays great, but how about CPS-2? Holy damn, these games are insane! Look at how much is on screen at once! Not gonna lie, I definitely dig this. The emulator? Well, it's really good. But I do think the performance is somewhat lesser than the CPS-1, with some moments of lag here and there in more intensive scenes. I expected that, but the fact that most of the time it's playing at what I assume to be perfect speeds is again, nothing short of phenomenal. It makes sense for me to give this a 9 out of 10 since it's somewhat lesser than CPS-1's performance, but honestly, even with how little I've said about its slowdown, I still think I'm making it sound worse than it is. This emulator might as well get a 10 out of 10 in performance. The Game Boy is a very weak platform to today's standards with specifications that can be emulated on just about anything. Even the Palm M515 could emulate a Game Boy. Poorly, but it still could. So you already know that the PSP should have no issues whatsoever in the emulation of its games. Master Boy V2.02 by Bruni plays Game Boy games perfectly. I tried Super Mario Land 2 6 Golden Coins, and on its own, for some reason it had this weird color palette applied to it. It wasn't a ROM hack, I guess this is a feature? I then tried the now popular Super Mario Land 2 DX, and unfortunately I couldn't get that one to boot, which was a shame. It kept detecting new VRAMs, there's some sort of incompatibility here for sure. Everything else I threw out it works just fine. Just be aware that a few intensive ROM hacks might not be compatible. Performance-wise, Master Boy V2.02 by Bruni gets a 9 out of 10 for emulating the Game Boy. I don't have much interest in my Atari Lynx, which is really unfortunate because I love the design it has. I just don't care for more than a select handful of games on it. Nonetheless, if I don't feel like hooking it up and using that subpar screen, we have handy PSP 0.95.1 to alleviate the need. First, I tried the only game I have for it, which was Chip's Challenge. First impressions weren't so hot, as the introduction lagged quite a bit with sound and visuals. I went into the emulator's options and tinkered with the PSP clock frequency and had a far better result, giving it a consistent frame rate. 
The sound was still quite bad though, with a slew of crackles left and right. Chip's challenge is totally playable though, which is a success in my books. I went on to try some other games I was unfamiliar with, like Joust. Wow, this is a really good port. Here the emulation was great too, playing at what I believe is full speed with great sound. I didn't hear any crackling in this one. I went on to Blue Lightning and wow, this looks incredible for a handheld at the time. The speed seemed perhaps a bit slower than on console, but was ultimately quite stable in frame rate and totally playable. The sound though is a bit of a killer for me. I tried Pac Land and, well, this one did not run very well at all. The speed is notably slower than on console and the sound is very crackly. Overall, in my testing, I discovered that most games are not going to sound very good, as the emulation of the Lynx's sound chip needs some work. This isn't a bad emulator, feels like a work in progress that didn't reach its full potential. I give Handy PSP 0.95.1's performance a 7 out of 10. In my heydays of playing PSP, it was always obvious that the emulation scene was quite fond of the Neo Geo AES. It's not a console of particular interest to me since I only dabbled in it back then, but returning to it now I can say that it is indeed quite an accomplishment. That is, if you can get the games to run in the first place. So the emulator is called MVS PSP 2.3.1. It comes with a ROM converter that'll turn Neo Geo ROMs into a readable format for the emulator. That's handy. However, this never seemed to have successful results. I went to YouTube to see if anyone had a tutorial. As it turns out, there are a few. I downloaded a ROM set provided with the emulator, and got to work nabbing footage. Unfortunately, I can't tell you how to get these things up and running, but at least I can show you their performance. Yep, once you finally got it running, it's an incredible emulator. 10 out of 10 for me. No problems I could find. However, I do feel weird giving a 10 out of 10 to an emulator I couldn't get up and running on my own terms, but we're talking about performance here. For Neo Geo CD games, I located NCDZ PSP 2.2.1 Ad Hoc, which I suppose means it's multiplayer compatible with other PSPs. Neato. I had no problems around the board, but I think I might have heard some crackles in the gameplay of Metal Slug 1. I can't really tell since it was crowded by machine gun fire, which very well could have been normal. NCDZ PSP 2.2.1 Ad Hoc gets a 10 out of 10 for me in performance. Someone was really dedicated in porting this stuff to the PSP, I'll tell you that for certain. And they did a damn fine job. So, the good old Sega Game Gear. Can I stop saying Master Boy V2.02 by Bruni yet? Probably not. What do you expect by now? They played great. 10 out of 10. Alright, so the Super Nintendo is a tough one. Throughout my years of playing Super Nintendo on PSP, it was always a very wishy-washy experience. Many games played far too slow, though some would play just fine. In recent years, it seems the scene took another dive into the Super Nintendo emulation, and wow has it ever improved. Also, yes, for those wondering, the FPS counter can be turned off. This emulator is called SNES 9X TYLME Mod 180404. Most games don't run at full speed, usually it ranges between 20 to 30 frames per second, which is still playable. 30 FPS equals the minimum of real-time footage, so being 10 frames below that isn't great, but it isn't bad either, all things considered. Now, a lot of these games can actually be played elsewhere. What did I do back when I couldn't play Donkey Kong Country or Yoshi's Island? I played the Game Boy Advance ports in a Game Boy Advance emulator. And guess what? Those worked great! If you're gonna use this emulator, you should consider two things. Firstly, this emulator overclocks the PSP. What that means is you're getting performance over battery life. Things such as this are mostly alleviated today by portable power banks, but it's still something to consider. Secondly, once your power has gone low, you'll receive a warning pop-up stating that save data, save states, and settings have been disabled to conserve the remaining life of the battery. Well, what if you're playing a game, having not saved yet, and suddenly this pops up? SNES 9X TYLME Mod 180404 s performance provides the best Super Nintendo experience out there for the PSP. Its performance gets a 7 out of 10 from me. I love DOS gaming. Getting it to run properly on the PSP can be a bit of a hassle, though. For the record, I'm not sure if you can even type on it. I don't recall there being a virtual keyboard, but feel free to prove me wrong. Thankfully, a lot of these games have been specifically optimized for their own eBoot releases, like with Wolfenstein 3D, Rise of the Triad, Rise, Rise, Rise of the Triad, and allegedly even Jazz Jackrabbit, though I haven't tried it myself. This is great news because a number of these games just aren't going to play the best in the default DOSBox settings. I don't know if any of these aforementioned eBoots use DOSBox or not, they might be relative to some sort of external source port, but whatever the case, some of the best are readily available to you with no hassle required. For other, more obscure titles, however, you'll just have to delve into DOSBox. I tried Cool Spot. It had some nice copy protection that I couldn't be bothered to deal with. I tried Catacomb 3D and... this happened. Essentially, you never know what you're going to have to do with these games until you try them. So it's a process of trial and error for sure, but thankfully there's some tweaking you can do and usually gets them to work just fine. Well, fine might be an overstatement, but you get the picture. Performance-wise, the emulation isn't great, but it does run, and for some games, it's alright. This is really going to depend on the era of game you're playing around with, but if I were to generalize the entire experience, I'd be giving the performance a 4 out of 10.
Scum VM. So these are still DOS games at heart, but there's a specific eboot known as Scum VM, which works with recreated game engines from various point-and-click games. It works perfectly, but I guess you could expect that from an engine recreation rather than emulation. I guess simulator is a better term to be using here. 10 out of 10. MAME is a multiple arcade machine emulator. It doesn't have a defined era to it, but yeah, the MAME is a tricky one. The arcade scene was a lot more invested in machines like the Capcom Play System and Neo Geo. Plus, with those, you only really have to deal with one piece of hardware, whereas in MAME, well, there's hundreds of thousands of possibilities. Still, I found compatibility with this thing to be abundantly limited. Very rarely did I get a game to boot at all, and some of them would even crash the emulator back to the XMB. Some of those that worked would also play no sound, even after having downloaded the audio samples for the games. But it's certainly not bad. Joust ran perfectly, I... Why is it always Joust that runs perfectly? Well, eh, I'm not complaining. Robotron 2084 worked, but oh man, what are these controls? Sinistar worked all right, but part of me wishes it didn't, so I didn't have to hear the Sinistar disrespected with such awful sound effects in place of the voice synthesizer. Let's try Zaxxon. Oh, what do you know? It works! Pretty good, too! There's no sound, but it's something. This game I... I'm honestly not a big fan of. Well, there's only one thing that can save MAME for all with its odd Dreamcast loading screen. Does MAME for All play Anteater? I'm still in a dream, Anteater. Performance, 10 out of 10. It plays the most underrated arcade game of all time. I wanted to end it there for jokes, but I do have to take this seriously, so Anteater runs just like it does in the arcades, which was a huge surprise for me. Still, MAME for All PSP V4.9R2's performance is severely lacking, especially considering arcade hits like Galaga aren't recognized. I mean, they are, but it has that whole missing files nonsense. This one problem has kept me from using anything other than the outdated MAME 32. The fifth generation is the most ambitious era for PSP emulation as far as I'm concerned, covering home consoles less than or just under a decade old. Do they run well? Let's find out. First stop, Jaguar with PJAG V0.0001. A lot of sites called it Virtual Jaguar, but that's the name for the emulator it's based on, not the PSP release. The Madman HCF seems to be working on some sort of updated Jaguar emulator for the PSP, as recent as January 8th, 2019. He says he'll release it if he's able to make it faster. For now, though, we'll be stuck with PJAG. There isn't really that much to say, because the emulator is just a proof of concept. And conceptually, it proves. I tried both Rayman and Alien vs Predator, which were both able to get in-game, but Alien vs Predator was slower than one frame per second. I counted, and it averaged at one frame every four seconds. I don't think I've ever tried to play something so slow before. I gave up pretty quickly. Rayman was a bit of a different story. It held a consistent four frames per second, which I thought to be quite impressive. If enough people cared about the Jaguar, I'd wager the PSP would have a totally playable emulator by now. To exit the game, you have to hard reset the PSP, since exiting manually just crashes the system. That's always fun. Keep in mind, when this was released, Jaguar emulators even on the PC were barely functional. To be honest, I think of this as a pretty big deal. Other than that, though, what can you really say? I tried one of those Bubsy games too, by the way, but it didn't even boot. If you want to try this emulator out for yourself, you'll need to know that you can only load up one ROM at a time. You're to place a Jaguar ROM next to the eBoot with the file name cf.jag, or else you'll see a split-second wall of text and get booted right back to the XMB. Took me a while to figure that out, no thanks to the absence of any kind of README document. Performance gets a 2 out of 10 only because Rayman is sort of playable. I'd imagine some other games might be as well. The Sega Saturn is pretty underrated. With underrated systems, particularly those with 3D capabilities, the emulation scene is usually pretty bleak. Such has been the case with Saturn emulators for the PC for many years. And the PSP doesn't try to combat that with your boss. Hey boss! Still, it boots games. You can play Panzer Dragoon at two frames per second. But I mean, hey, seeing this actually happen on a PSP? Way past cool. Performance is a 1 out of 10, but you already knew that. The PSP has the ability to play every PlayStation 1 game, at least as far as I've tested. There are a few methods on how to do this, but I'm sure someone else has covered that in detail. These should all run at their originally intended speeds. Anyways, need I give this a performance review? You've all likely been waiting for this one to show up. The Nintendo 64 has been emulated on the PSP for over a decade. It's nothing short of incredible, but has it improved over the years? Why yes! Here's Daedalus X64 1.1.6. Is it a reliable emulator? Well, kind of. 
There's compatibility lists all around the net if you want to look those up, but most people will just tell you the Marios and Zeldas work great and call it a day. I quickly got to capturing Super Mario 64 footage and it ran great. Audio is usually quite crackly, but it does clear up from time to time. It certainly isn't painful to listen to, unlike some other emulators that shove those crackles right down your ear holes. I tried a number of other games, and to my recollection, the compatibility far exceeds what it could do when I last delved onto the PSP scene. Kirby 64 plays just about full speed at times. It's awesome to see how playable Star Fox 64 is. Doom 64 is an easy recommendation, so long as you put your brightness on max. I always hated changing the settings on my CRT back when for this game. Mario Kart 64 works well, but the jittering sprites are really noticeable at points. When you try your best, but you'd suck. Turok Dinosaur Hunter was... odd. It had input lag that lasted about 5 seconds until it registered. Entirely unplayable, but still kinda cool to see on the PSP. What you see here is just the game demo, because you really could not control it in-game. Yoshi's Story is... kinda playable? It sure has a lot of graphical problems. I recall playing Yoshi's Story on my PSP long ago without it looking like this, so what's the deal? Let's dig out that old N64 emulator. Huh? Is my memory false? Alright, let's play around with some settings here. Ah, perfect! So the problem was based on a setting that broke the graphics. Not sure which one, I was just ticking options at random. I guess that goes to show this emulator's performance can improve with various tweaks. Give your favorite game a couple tries on different settings and you might actually come across a dramatically improved experience. There's a theme you've no doubt noticed, and it's that sound is crackly around the board. Something's wrong with the G yeah, it ain't the G-Diffuser, Falco. Still, Nintendo 64 emulation on the PSP has come a long way, and even with its consistent crackles, it remains an emulator of a system that had no right to play remotely well on the PSP. I should make mention that having sound enabled at all, though, can cause some games to crash. In fact, both BioFreaks and Super Smash Bros. hardlocked my PSP with audio enabled, yet without it, it would continue to play. I'm not sure why. Oh, one last thing. Allegedly, Rayman 2 is playable, but that wasn't the case for me. No matter what I tried, it wouldn't boot. There's actually two listings of the game here, so maybe mine was... whatever this one was? Anyways, performance-wise, I'd give Daedalus X64 1.1.6 a 6 out of 10. Master Freakin' Boy V2.02 by Bruni. Time for some Game Boy Color, and the last time I have to mention Master Boy. So, I was actually suggested to try out a different Game Boy Color emulator, one being called Rin GBC. I tried it and... wow, it did not play very good. I was recommended this one because of its rewind feature. I mean, yeah, that's cool and all, but save states are all you really need. Especially when you've otherwise got to deal with performance like this. Shantae, wh what did they do to you? Back to Master Boy. Dookie Nookie, Dookie Nookie plays fine on Master Boy, unlike Rin. As did everything else I tried except... Shantae. I know this was one of the more graphically intensive Game Boy Color games, but do all the graphics have to look like waffles? I would have loved to have Shantae on my PSP, but I guess those dreams will have to wait. Wait, what the... Pausing the game fixed it? That's odd, okay, uh, now I guess I can play Shantae? Hooray? Maybe? Master Boy V2.02 by Bruni getting that 9 out of 10 performance rating. Good job, Master Boy, you've proven yourself. Now shut up and let the others have a turn. The sixth generation of gaming for the PSP emulator scene will consist only of handhelds. Introducing Race PSP 2.16. So I know there's a Sonic game on here, let's check that out. Uh, Sonic Jam World music? That's an odd choice, but I guess it was never used in a 2D Sonic game, so that works. I might have to look at this game in a separate video. Oh right, performance. Yeah, it plays alright. But there's some very noticeable slowdowns at points. Doesn't play good, but doesn't play bad. Oh my god. Puyo Puyo! Because what's a console without some kind of Puyo Puyo on it? Yeah, it plays fine. So does Pac-Man and everything else I tried. Race PSP 2.16 gets a performance rating of 9 out of 10 from me. Game Boy Advance performance has always been pretty good for the PSP emulators. Even long ago, you could play most games with ease. However, certain games did indeed struggle. Some unfortunate titles, like Rayman Hoodlum's Revenge, would fail to play past taking your first step, for some bizarre reason. Other games, particularly first-person shooters, barely played at all. Notable examples are Duke Nukem Advance and Doom 2, which were borderline unplayable. An emulator known as Temp GBA Mod seeks to fix a lot of the problems with past GBA PSP emulation. Not only is the speed dramatically improved for those underperforming games, Rayman Hoodlum's Revenge is fixed? Hooray! Those first-person shooters still aren't perfect, though. There are times when the audio gets so crackly that it hurts to listen to. Without sound, though, you've got a pretty solid experience with these now. You can actually play them. That's a huge step forward. 
The Game Boy Advance has a 3D perspective view capability known as Mode 7, the same sort of effect that was used in some Super Nintendo games like F-Zero. There has always been some issues with emulating Mode 7 on the PSP. A noteworthy example is with Rayman 3. Yes, another Rayman game. I know I'm seen as a Rayman YouTuber in some light, but this is purely coincidence, I swear. Yes, system-intensive games still suffer a bit, but it's minor, and far better than any of the builds before it. I give this emulator's performance an 8, leaning more towards a 9 out of 10. You don't need Rayman 3 for GBA, really. There exists a large range of Java games to be installed on your PSP via PSP KVM 0.5.5. But of course, different phone models call for different midlets. Are you downloading the best version of the Java game to be played on your PSP? A lot of that will be trial and error. You don't really know until you've installed it. By the by, you install games in PSP KVM, not just load them as a ROM image. This might sound like a crossroads, but it's really quite simple. Just click Find Applications and find the directory you've placed the ROMs at. Then pick a resolution. Again, that's kind of trial and error. You can always uninstall the midlet and reinstall it for a different resolution, which is a bit of a process, but hey, you can still do it. Most of these games didn't have much going on in the sound department, so if you hear long periods of nothingness, chances are it is playing like it should. I tried Splinter Cell Conviction, and I couldn't get past this prompt no matter what I tried. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood seemed to play fine, but after checking out a video of it online, it looks like this is actually playing quite slow. It would occasionally ask me if I wanted to connect to a network. I'm not sure if this was a bug or not. I've never had an emulator ask me if I wanted to connect to the internet. And that's the sixth ch Oh wait, wait, what's this? Do we have time for a bonus emulator? I think we do. How about the Sega freaking Dreamcast? Yeah, I would have never believed it unless I saw it, but here it is in front of our own eyes, Dreamcast running on a PSP. There's a YouTube channel which has posted some videos about this being the real PSP Demon, which features many concepts such as the System BIOS, Shenmue, Power Stone, Crazy Taxi, and this emulator looked to be in better status than some of those that were released to the public. As far as I'm able to tell, this emulator never made it into our hands and stayed with the development. There's an archive Wayback Machine page, but I'm not so sure this was distributed past insiders. Can you believe this was from 2008? This isn't even recent. This isn't even past the quickly developing era for Dreamcast emulation on the PC. Is this footage faked? I mean, if it is, it's a really good fake. It has a boot sequence, an FPS counter, horrible graphical glitches. The only thing that makes it seem fake is the speed. I don't understand how this could have been possible, yet here it is. What do you think? Was this faked or was this genuinely a developing emulator? I think it's real, but I'm open to other takes on this. The seventh generation of gaming on the PSP has almost no legs to stand on. Almost, as there exists a very experimental Nintendo DS emulator, a console from 2004, which on the PSP is far behind a truly playable state. This is really just a concept idea that was released to the public to try out. Anyways, I tested three games in the emulator, New Super Mario Bros, Kirby Squeak Squad, and Rayman Raving Rabbids. Mario had an absence of 3D models, which seems to be the case across all the games I tested. You can get into the game, but it's ridiculously slow and you can't see Mario anyways, so you're just awaiting the inevitable death, really. Kirby Squeak Squad played slightly better, but I rested my case moments into the first stage as Kirby got stuck on an infinite suck. Also, when it was loading, I got this satanic imagery. Nintendo's really taking piracy very seriously these days. Rayman Raving Rabbids barely functioned, but I guess I did get into the menus? I'm not really sure, to be honest. And... that's it. Whew. Could you tell I was speeding up towards the end there? I've been recording this script for five hours. There were a few consoles emulated on the PSP that I know I missed out on. For example, the Bondi Wonderswan, Atari ST. There's even a Virtual Boy emulator, but I tried it myself and honestly, I wasn't having any luck with it, so I kept it out. So that's the video. Hope you enjoyed it. As you can tell, there are a lot of possibilities when it comes to retro gaming on the PSP, and I liked revisiting it. If you'd like to see some more PSP videos, I have a couple ideas, like reviewing a bunch of homebrew in one big video or something along the lines of that. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch all you frame raiders in the next one. Oh, my mouth is so dry, and I want to eat, and I want to sleep. Oh.